Tonight we're going to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago in our study of certain songs and why certain songs are unscriptural. As I uh, gave the lesson the first time, uh, please, if you have any songs that you have any questions about, please uh, write down the number and put it in the box or give it to me, and we will try to look at that song um, in the future to see whether it's in harmony with God's will. We made the point the last time that we spoke on this that it is possible to sing a false teaching just as much as it is possible to preach or teach a false teaching. We need to be very careful in what we sing. We must realize that many of the songs that we are singing in our songbook were not written by Christians. They were written by religious people, but they were not written by Christians according to the New Testament definition of a Christian. So there is a danger that we need to be aware of that sometimes denominational theology can be present within certain songs and it could be very subtle and we not be aware of it. Some of the songs that I used to sing in the past that I really enjoyed and really loved the melody to, after examining the message of the song, I realized I can't sing them anymore because they are in error. They are teaching something that's wrong. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 tells us, after he tells us to be filled with the Spirit, Paul tells us to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So our songs that we sing, we speak to one another. Our songs are towards God, but we're speaking one another because we're encouraging one another. Colossians 3 and verse 16, Paul says to the church at Colossae, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So we understand that our singing is to God, but it is to one another as well. And you notice in Colossians 3 and verse 16, we are to teach one another. Teach and admonish. Teaching and encouraging one another with our songs. We must, as Paul said, sing with the Spirit and sing with the understanding. And as Jesus said in John 4, 23 and 24, our worship must be in spirit and in truth. We must be careful that we do not sing something that's out of harmony with God's will. That is why we are examining the message of certain songs. If you would take out your blue song book and, pay, and turn to page 959. 959. This is a song that I used to like to sing. I may have led it a few times. I don't remember in years past. But as I examined the message of this song, I came to realize that this is not in harmony with the scriptures for two basic reasons. We're going to look at the first one, and then as we go through and look at some scriptures, we're going to examine the second one. 959, just a little talk with Jesus. We're going to read through the song, and then we're going to get into the first reason why this song is unscriptural. Look at the uh, very first line there. It says, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above, and just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Second line. S uh, sometimes my path seems drear without any ray of cheer, and then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. The mist of sin may rise and hide the starry skies, but just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Third line. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but just a, uh, Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Then you have the chorus, have a little talk with Jesus, tell him all about your troubles, he will hear your faintest cry, he will answer by and by. 
You know, if you feel a little powerful yearning, um, your heart to, unto heaven is turning, you may find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Very catchy song. Used to love to sing it, but I don't anymore. For two reasons. I'll give the two reasons and then we'll examine why. First of all, in the New Testament, there is a procedure or a protocol for prayer. Prayer is directed to the Father through Jesus Christ. Not to Jesus, through Jesus. And that is very important. Understanding that there is one God that consists of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three distinct beings or consciousness of deity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When Jesus was on earth, you had God the Son on earth. Now think about this. The Holy Spirit is a person just like the Father, just like the Son. They're both, they're all three divine persons of the one God. Jesus never directed prayer to the Holy Spirit. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he never worded one prayer to the Holy Spirit. He always prayed to the Father. The Father who art in heaven, he taught us to pray. In John chapter 17, the longest recorded prayer of Christ, we find that Jesus is directing prayer to the Father. Now he speaks of the Holy Spirit. He tells his apostles, I'm going to send him unto you. But he never wants, do we ever have a record of him praying to the Holy Spirit? Now when we look at the pattern of prayer, after Jesus ascends back to the Father, we're going to see that prayer is going to be in the name of Jesus or through Jesus Christ unto the Father. Our prayers are to be directed to him. John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. In John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is going to prepare the apostles for the change in the way they pray. Before then, they weren't praying in the name of Jesus. But they will. And he's given that instruction concerning that. Because Jesus was still on earth. He was not yet in the role of being a mediator. Remember we studied this morning, he ascended back to the Father to be our high priest and be our mediator. He had not yet done that, but he was preparing them for when the change would come, when the new covenant or the new testament would come into effect. John 14, verse 12 through 14, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father, verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, Christ hears our prayers. However, in proper prayer, according to New Testament teaching, we're not speaking to him, but through him. Does he still hear? Yes. Does the Holy Spirit still hear? Yes. But he's making it very clear there's going to be a change and who you focus in on because of the greater revelation that we find in the New Testament. Now look at John chapter 15 and verse 16. In John 15 and 16, he's going to make it even clearer. John chapter 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name... He will give you. Ask the Father in my name. Praying through Christ to the Father in the name of Jesus. Now, look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse 23 and 24. These verses are very vital in understanding this. John chapter 16, verse 23 and 24. In that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, He will give you. Until now, verse 24, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. 
He's saying, up until now, you have not prayed in my name. But he's making it very clear that he's going back to the Father to be our representative before the Father as our high priest, as our go-between, our mediator. As a result of being our one mediator, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, being our high priest that can sympathize with us, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, he says, in that day, that's talking about the New Testament period in which we are living now, you will ask me nothing in that day. You will ask me nothing. So we cannot teach that you ask Jesus something or pray to Jesus or have a little talk with Jesus. Because Jesus is saying in that day, talking about when he ascends back to the Father, you will ask me nothing, but whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Why? He's the mediator. We go through him to the Father. Now, does Jesus hear those prayers? Of course. Does the Holy Spirit hear those prayers? Romans chapter 8 makes it very clear that the Holy Spirit intercedes for the saints. Of course he hears them. But who are we to address in prayer according to the pattern? The Father. Now let's give further evidence for this. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. You find this all throughout the epistles. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. For this reason, Paul says, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, uh, according to his riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. Notice Paul here is praying for the Ephesians, and he's bowing his knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is hearing the prayer, but Paul is addressing the Father. He is, using the words of this song, having a little talk with the Father, not Christ. That's the pattern of prayer that we find. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father... In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly what Jesus said that they would do in that day. Referring to the New Testament period. So our thanks is given to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ will hear that prayer. But our prayer is addressed to God the Father. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 3. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 3. Paul says we give thanks to the to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Praying for the Colossian brethren is giving thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice God the Father is being addressed in the prayer. Same chapter, Colossians 1 and verse 12. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who qualifies us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Again, giving thanks to the Father. Colossians chapter 3, same book, chapter 3, verse 17. Verse 17. <clears throat> and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So the address of the prayer is to God the Father through Jesus Christ, our Savior, will He hear that prayer? Will will Jesus hear it? Yes. But the pattern of prayer is addressed to the Father within the Godhead. Not the Son and not the Holy Spirit. Now there might be many reasons why this is true, but the fact of the matter is, Jesus is our mediator. We go through Him to the Father. Jesus is our high priest. And the very fact that we have this evidence throughout Scripture that prayers are directed to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ makes it very clear that this is the pattern of prayer under normal circumstances. Now, you will come across passages in which people like Stephen refer to Jesus Christ 
when he was being stoned. But that is an extraordinary situation. Why? It's miraculous. He is seeing a vision of Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father. And as a result, he's saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So that is a miraculous situation that is out of the ordinary. In the ordinary scheme of things, the non-miraculous, which age we live in since the first century, we pray to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We go back to what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus taught us to pray to the Father. Jesus will hear it if we do it according to His will in His name through Him. The Holy Spirit will hear it. But we are to speak to, address the Father in prayer. So as we go back and look at this song in light of the scriptures that we have here, the very title tells me just a little talk with Jesus is an unscriptural concept. I cannot scripturally, biblically, have a little talk with Jesus, tell Him all about my struggles. He will hear my faintest cry. Well, yes, He will. But I'm told to pray to the Father. That's what the Holy Spirit revealed in the New Testament. In the name of or through Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing that is unscriptural with that song. And if there's any song in the book, and we might come across some others as we go through it and search through our song book, that suggests that we pray to, the, to Christ, that would be an unscriptural concept. Now, let me make this footnote here. Singing to Jesus is a different form of worship. Prayer and songs are two different forms of worship. So if we pray to Jesus... We are doing something that the Bible does not address, tells us that we're to address the Father. However, singing is a separate concept than prayer. Is there similarity? Yes, but they're different. That's why we pray and we sing. Songs in which we address God, we might refer to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We praise the O God, in which we refer to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in that song would not be unscriptural because you have various examples within the Bible of psalms being directed to the, to the Son, but these are not prayers, they are songs of praise. So singing and praying are two separate concepts. Now, back to the song 959, which is teaching that we pray to Jesus. An unscriptural concept we've already established. The second thing that is wrong with this song. Did you notice the very first verse? We need to look at the wording of this very carefully. It's teaching salvation by the sinner's prayer. Did you catch that? Salvation by the sinner's prayer. Look at the wording. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above. Lamb's Book of Life. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. That is the sinner's prayer that denominations teach. They teach you have this little talk with Jesus, accept Jesus into your heart, and that will make you whole. That will write your name above. That will save you. And that's unscriptural. What if I got up? Remember, I established this two weeks ago. What if I got up and I preached a sermon that says we can pray to Jesus Christ, tell Him all about our problems? Well, brethren who know the Bible would get upset about that. Because we know from the scriptures that's, that's not how it works. There's certain protocol to prayer if we're going to follow the biblical pattern. What if I got up one Sunday and I said, for you to be whole, for you to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, just have a little talk with Jesus. Just, just have a little talk with Him. 
well, brethren would have my hide. And rightly so, because that would be false doctrine. Then why could we sing it? We can't sing it. If it's, and this is, this is what I established two weeks ago. If we can't take a song and preach it without teaching false doctrine, why do we think we could sing it? We can't. Because we can sing a false doctrine just as much as we could preach a false doctrine, teach a false doctrine, or even pray a false doctrine if we do not pray as we ought, according to the biblical pattern. So we see here in this song that it is something that it should not be sung. And like I said, if there's any other songs in our songbook that teach us to pray to Jesus, then that would be something that goes along with this same concept that it would be unscriptural according to the biblical teaching on things. We do not have a little talk with Jesus to make us whole or to be saved. That is an unbiblical, foreign concept as far as a person becoming a Christian and receiving salvation. In Mark 16 and verse 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He did not say repent and pray. There is not one example of a person receiving salvation through a prayer. Prayer is the privilege of the child of God. You become a child of God, then you have the privilege of prayer. We have to understand that. So if someone is teaching, whether it be through a song or through a message that they're preaching, that you become a Christian, you can have your name written above, you can be made whole by simply having a little talk with Jesus, that's not right, according to the Bible. We will continue this series next week. We hope that those who are here will continue to be with us during this series. If you need to become a Christian, we urge you to do so. We're not going to ask you to say a sinner's prayer. It's not in the Bible. We're going to ask you to do what the Bible says, obey the gospel. Confess your faith, repent of your sins, and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, and the Lord will add you to His church. If you've done that and you've gone astray, as a child of God, you can repent and pray and ask for forgiveness. Acts chapter 8. And when you do that, He will forgive. He will cleanse you and make you His once again. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and sing.